Thank you very much for the seminar organizer. Uh, my great pleasure to speak here. I feel very happy to come back to Princeton University. I, I did my PhD here, um, uh, of course, in the university. So I'm going to talk about uh, um, something about uh, stochastic PDEs. So these are equations coming from uh, quantum field theory. So these are called stochastic quantization equations. Um, so first of all, let, let me just uh, uh, quickly uh, review what stochastic quantization means. Um, so this is a procedure to uh, regard a Euclidean quantum field theory measure as a stationary measure uh, of a stochastic process. Uh, uh, so, um, so in quantum field theory, usually, um, so in, in the so-called Euclidean quantum field theory, basically we consider a field theory in Euclidean space instead of Minkowski space. Um, so usually we, we deal with uh, this type of measures. Um, so phi is a function here, and then s of phi is a functional uh, of phi. Then we have this kind of uh, measure. Now d phi is a formal Lebesgue measure. Of course, uh, this uh, infinite dimensional Lebesgue measure it doesn't make quite uh, doesn't quite make sense, but it's a formal way to write this measure. And z is a normalization factor. Um, so we want to find out uh, we want to write down uh, dynamics such that this measure is an environment measure, at least formally, for this dynamics. Um, now here, this is the functional derivative of the action s over the phi, over the field phi. And uh, c is the so-called space-time y noise. Uh, basically, it's a Gaussian distribution on space and time with Dirac correlation. OK, so the, um, to, this, this is a Dirac distribution, essentially the, this Y noise is a distribution, not a function. This, this is only the formal way to write the correlation. Um, so, so if you think of the most, uh, most simple example, say in zero space dimension, um, say our field is just a random number. The phi is just a random number x, and then the action is just a quadratic one. Um, then basically, this is a Gaussian measure on, on the real line. And uh, the corresponding dynamics is the orthogonal dynamics. So the Gaussian measure is the invariant measure for austin uhlenbeck dynamics, austin uhlenbeck equation. Um, of course, a more interesting question is uh, the case that phi is really a function. So um, now consider, uh, say, phi is a, is, a, is a functional distribution living on the d-dimensional space. Then we have such a uh, action, the first term is quadratic. Um, then the, the second term is non-quadratic. If you only have the quadratic term, then this measure is going to be a Gaussian measure. This is actually the Gaussian free field. Um, but, but actually, with, with additional terms, this is not Gaussian. Uh, so if you take the functional derivative of uh, this action, you get um, this equation. OK, so um, the non-Gaussian part corresponds to non-linearity in the equation. OK, finally, another example is uh, we also have this Gaussian part in the quantum field theory, and then we have a trigonometric nonlinearity. So this is the corresponding dynamical equation. Um, OK, so these are some examples. Um, and uh, uh, what are the basic questions? What are the um, difficulties to, to study uh, such, such uh, measures or equations? So on the quantum field theory side, um, the quest basic question is how to construct these measures. Um, yeah, so, OK, so, so on the field theory side, we want to construct the measure. Because these measures are uh, infinite dimensional measures. Um, the, the way we can think about it is um, we can first um, uh, consider finite dimensional appro approximations. We, we take a lattice and then define a measure on, 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 on the function over the lattice, and then we take the continuum limit. Uh, of course, in, in most cases, you cannot just take the, con uh, the continuum limit. Um, you have to do some sort of renormalization. So I'm going to uh, talk about renormalization later. Um, then the corresponding question, I mean, the the question corresponding to construct the measures uh, on the SPDE side uh, is, the, uh, is a question like we want to construct the solutions. In other words, we want to study well-postness 
for, uh, for these equations with certain initial data. Uh, OK, so, so why is the well postness problem very hard for these equations? The difficulty for studying the well postness um, is uh, it comes from the singularity of the random input, the Cassi. So Cassi is a very singular space-time distribution. It's not a function. Um, if we only consider, forget about the nonlinearity for the moment, only consider the linear equation, then of course you, you have a Laplacian here, which may improve some regularity. But um, starting actually starting from two dimension, like uh, if, if the space dimension two or higher, then the solution to the linear equation uh, is going to be almost surely distribution. Um, actually, the higher uh, in, in higher dimension, the the uh, space time y noise becomes more and more singular. So, if the linear solution is a distribution, then the problems comes uh, now. Uh, the problem is, it doesn't make sense to take a cubic or take a smooth function of a distribution because distribution doesn't have pointwise value. Um, so this is the, the, the essentially the difficulty to study the well posted. It actually, uh, uh, th one of the questions is how to interpret this, this equation, uh, how to interpret the solution, what, what, we, what, what we mean by a solution to these equations. Um, so a different point of view to, to look at the difficulty is, suppose we replace the noise, uh, the singular noise, by a smooth noise. So we, we take this smooth approximation to the white noise. And then, of course, everything becomes smooth. Then we have um, smooth solution, u epsilon. To take epsilon goes to 0. Uh, and turns out that in this limiting procedure, the sequence of smooth solutions does not converge to any non-trivial limit. Of course, I mean, these are just two different viewpoints to, to look at the same difficulty. Um, and the second viewpoint will be our uh, start point of the analysis. Um, OK, so in this talk, I'm going to talk two different methods to solve these equations. The, the first one is called the product of Bush method, uh, which was introduced in uh, like 15 years ago. Um, this method can solve the 5-4 equation in two space dimension. And it can also solve the sine Gordon equation for beta square over 4 pi, uh, smaller than 4 pi. Um, so here, I mean, uh, we have a slightly different notation. So our beta correspond to the square root of beta in quantum field theory. Okay. Just, just want to, um, yeah. Um, and uh, of course, so, uh, maybe I, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, for the sine Gordon equation, we only take two space dimension. I can only the two space dimension is, is, is interesting, essentially. Um, and uh, it, it will turn out that um, the, for, for a larger value of beta, the solution, uh, the well post is, is, is going to be harder to prove. OK, so the second theory I want to discuss is the recent theory by Martin Heyer, uh, regular structure. Um, this new theory can deal with the 5-4 equation in three dimension. And uh, it can, so we also show well postness of sine Gordon equation for larger values of beta with this new theory. Um, so we show that if beta square is less than this special value, then we have local well postness for sine Gordon equation. Uh, of course, I mean, it, it, uh, uh, this theory can, can show well postness can show local well postness of sine Gordon for all beta square less than 8 pi. But this is um, not, not done yet. So, um, so, so I, I, I want to ask you, so the 5 fourths in 3D that Hara does, or maybe the de later developments which you were telling me about, yeah. this, is, this is local, this is well postness this is in, in just uh, short time. Or short time, short yeah. Short time, finite time. Right. So I, I'm going to focus on short time, I mean, local well postness on torus. But, but uh, 
these these results of uh, well, yeah. So the problem the Bruce, this, this is still finite time, not not global time or what? Uh, I'm only going to talk about uh, local one. Uh, okay. uh, short time, short time. Uh, yeah. In the end, maybe I get uh, I have okay. short remark. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. In five point, do you have in finite volume? Do you have uh, forget what you told me. You yeah. have global yeah. This yeah. Is yeah, people yeah, people already proved that. Mm. Yeah. In three dimension on the torus. Yeah, on three dimensional torus. Okay. Um so so there are a lot of alternative theories. For example, in two D the five four can be solved using Dirichlet forms, um uh, which is different from the product of Bush. And uh, in, in three dimension, the five four can be also solved using so-called a para uh, control distribution um, method or or a renormalization group method developed by Kupiainen. So these are all re very recent so, uh, methods. Uh, uh, this, what is this Gubinelli uh, stuff? Do? What, is, what is this para control mean? It, so it's a kind of para product. Uh, so. The, the difficulty for these equations is to make sense of a product or power. Yeah. So in free analysis, you know, there, there's a French group yeah. that they're dealing with a para product. You, you, you consider low modes, high modes, then um, um, you basically you do, do uh, this decomposition. Um, and the problem is always um, um, to define the product between the high modes of the two, two, um, two functions. So, so yeah. So there is another method along that line. <coughs> okay. Um, so the plan of this talk is uh, I'm going to focus on the sine Gordon equation to mm, illustrate the basic ideas. I, and then in the end, I also um, remark how the same idea apply to five four equation. And if in the end I have, I have some time, I talk about the equation from gauge theory. Um, okay, so let's just look at the sine Gordon equation. Now, the first method I want to talk about is the, the product de Bush method. Uh, this this idea is very simple actually. So you only look at the uh, forget about nonlinearity. Only look at the linear equation. Uh, suppose phi. Oh, so of course the, the epsilon is just uh, I just remind you the epsilon is kind of modify uh, uh, modification procedure. Uh, so cosine epsilon is a smooth noise. So we want to understand what happens if epsilon is going to zero. Um, now phi solves the linear equation, uh, and we suppose u can be written as uh, the linear solution plus a remainder called v. Now of course we can write down the equation for v. Uh, we use the basic, the elementary uh, trigonometric identity, uh, put this ansatz into the, the, the sign, and then uh, you can write down the equation for v. Of course. The space-time white noise disappears in the, uh, in the in the equation for v because they, they cancel out. Um, but now we have two random inputs here, uh, the red coefficients here. Um, uh, so the phi here, because it solves the linear equation, noise is Gaussian, so phi is also also a Gaussian process. So essentially, first of all, we want to understand um, can we really define sine of a Gaussian and cosine of a Gaussian. In other words, the exponential i beta phi. Um, so now suppose um, these new random, random uh, terms, this is sine phi, cosine phi, really have a uh, non-trivial limit called psi. Actually, they, they do not have non-trivial limit, but suppose they have some sort of non-trivial limit, then essentially the equation for V is going to look like um, some structure, some basic, the basic structure is something, look, uh, something like this. So the, the, the non-linear part is just this, this limiting uh, guy psi times the smooth function f of V. So at this stage, this, co this function is cosine and that function is sine, this doesn't matter anymore. So it just takes a smooth function f. Okay, so let's just look at, first look at this uh, PDE. Um, how do we solve this PDE? Oh. Now suppose this psi is not that singular. 
suppose it has regularity above negative one. Um, of course, there are different ways to define this function space, but I don't want to talk about harmonic analysis. But I mean, essentially, this is like equivalent with best of negative one infinity infinity. Anyway, so suppose the psi is not that singular; it's about uh, above negative one. Then, of course, the most natural argument for local wall postness is fixed point argument. So we write down the fixed point map. Um, we take a generic element v. Then it maps to heat kernel convolve this term. Now, the crucial step in this fixed point argument is we want to find the function space, and uh, then find and then look for a fixed point in this function space. So, the crucial step is um, which function space we want uh, in which we want to formulate this fixed point argument. Um, Actually, um, the most important thing is um, we want to find a space for, for V such that the fixed point map brings the generic element in this space back to the same space. And this is the most important. So actually, we can take C1, actually differentiable uh, functions, as our space for V I mean in, in two dimensions. So, uh, so now everything is in two, di two space dimensions. Um, now, the reason we can choose C1 as our space for V is based on two basic facts. So the first fact is so-called Young theorem. So Young theorem says if we want to make, if we want to take a product between, say, one distribution and one function, then as long as the sum of two regularities is positive, then you can define this product product in a classical way, and the product is it has regularity, which is the minimum of the two regularities. Um, now, by, uh, by our assumption that Psi has regularity above negative 1, and then our answer V belongs to C1. So this condition is satisfied. So this means the product is defined classically, and the product is, has regularity above negative 1. The second fact. I mean, OK, so this condition is really Im important. I mean, it's really uh, necessary. If, if this condition is violated, we have a simple example. This is Brown emotion times the differenti uh, differential of Brown emotion. Uh, so uh, B has regularity below 1 half. DB has regularity below negative 1 half. This condition is violated. So there's no classical way to define this product. Okay. And second, the second fact is so-called the Schauder estimate, which essentially says the heat kernel gives us two more regularity. So if the, this product has regularity above negative 1, then um, the fixed point map brings this V uh, generic element in C1 back to C1 again. Okay. So this is the part of the Bush argument. Now, so of course, I mean, to, to show um, 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 the fixed point map really takes generic element. Uh, uh, now, now we have shown that the, the fixed, mo fi fixed point map really takes the generic, ar uh, generic element back to the same space. But we also want to show contractivity. But as long as the time is short, this, this is very standard. Um, OK. Now back to our equation. Our question is, does this guy, this red term, really convert to a limit which has regularity above negative 1 or not. Okay. Um, so this term is a random term. To study convergence or regularity of a random process, uh, we can use the called Kolmogorov argument. We take the moments. Um, so um, if we want to show a random process, f uh, epsilon converges to a limit f in C gamma, then the way we show this is we take a, a approximate delta function, then we take the inner product of this process with, uh, with this uh, uh, test function. Now, since we expect the limit is a distribution, so if phi goes, if test function goes to delta function, of course, this inner product is going to blow up because f is, uh, f is a distribution. Um, so this um, power 
gamma is expected to be negative. So this really describes how fast um, this guy is blown up as phi converges to delta function. And uh, of course, this inner product is, uh, is still a random guy. So we take a piece moment. So this is what we mean by converge, converging to an element in C gamma. Okay. Basically, we want to study the moments of this guy. Okay. So let's look at the moment. Uh, let's first take the second moment. So we take a we take this guy and then test against the test function and then square it. Take the expectation. We want to show this bounded by lambda to the correct power gamma. So gamma is uh, we we ask whether we can uh, take gamma to be. Um, something bigger than negative 1. OK. Uh, well, this test function is deterministic. Uh, we, we, so this is a square outside the integral. We can duplicate the integral and then take the expectation inside. Right? So essentially, we want to understand the correlation of this guy. But now, remember, phi is a Gaussian process. So this calculation is essentially a, you know, a characteristic function of Gaussian. So this is just equal to, to this. So the, you take the expectation in the exponent. Now, if you open this square, you have a crossing term, and then you have two square terms. So the crossing term turns out to be logarithmic, uh, logarithmically um, correlated. Uh, essentially, this is the Green's function in two dimension. This is why I said actually this this equation is only interesting in two in two dimension. So the correlation, the covariance of this guy is 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 a log function. Now, if if the two points are identical, I mean, if you look at the two square terms coming from here, then it's a logarithmic divergent constant. And uh, this divergent constant is like the, the reason why this red term does not have any uh, non-trivial limit. So, it, so we, we want to renormalize this guy so that we can cancel this logarithmic divergent constant. So this is the idea of renormalization. So Precisely speaking, we, the renormalization procedure is we want to replace this guy by um, the same uh, same exponential of phi times the times this divergent constant. Now, I define this as psi. Okay. I, I, I don't. Uh, you're, I, I know what you're gonna do. You're gonna yeah. Get more work to be but there's no. Mm. Yeah. So here I have log epsilon, then I have exponential of it. Yeah. So here, uh, then putting this together, I have epsilon to the power beta square over 4 pi. Yeah. So. But, but your, your size, you're normalized field, right? Normalized field. Is psi going to be the renormalized field? Psi is going to be the renormalized field. Yeah, yeah. But then, see, all you. All I think you have a typo there, because I'm uh, misunderstanding something, because there's no epsilon. Uh, I, oh, I see. I see. It's not E. It's epsilon. Epsilon. <laughs> that's epsilon. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry, that's my, my eyes. Yeah. So it's that's epsilon to the minus. So it's yeah. epsilon is small. You do have a, a, you have a serious factor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's E to the log epsilon. That's why I was looking for it. E to the log epsilon. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, e, essentially a power it's epsilon. Yeah. So I, I take this negative power epsilon, which cancels the positive power. Yeah. Okay. So basically, if you redo this calculation with the new guy psi, then you are going to find out basically you don't have the squ the square terms. You only have the crossing term here, yeah. which is a log uh, is a log function of z minus z prime. So essentially, it's z minus z prime to the power negative beta square over two pi. Okay. This is a simple calculation and. Uh, now, of course, you put this correlation back to this uh, this, this uh, quantity and then integrate against the test function. You are going to find out this really bounded by lambda to the power 2 gamma, where gamma is equal to ma minus beta square over 2 pi. This means as long as beta square is less than 4 pi, then um, 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 
Oh, so this, uh, this is the typo. So this is beta squared over 4 pi. So the regularity of the limit, because the correlation is beta squared over 2 pi, so, so one, one copy, is should, one factor should be this divided by 2. So beta squared over 4 pi uh, is the correct regularity for the limiting object. And therefore, if beta squared is less than 4 pi, uh, the limit of the renormalized object indeed um, has regularity above negative 1. And therefore, the Dabrado de Bush method works. So, so if you go back, to just to make it clear to people uh, how this works, mm -hmm. you don't solve the original equation. So solve I solve the, the remainder solve, equation. Solve renormalized equation right? oh, oh, solve the renormalized equation. So, so, so explain how that goes. OK. So see, the first equation doesn't have any interesting solutions. So yeah. You have to yeah. change the equation to make it uh, okay. give you something. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm doing here, I multiply this guy by this divergent factor amounts to multiplying a, diver a divergent constant, the same divergent constant in front of nonlinearity for the for the equation. So that's the equation yeah. you actually solve. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's this. One that has a nice look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the renormalization is reflected on the equation level like this. OK. So there's one argument missing, actually, the, the hard part. Um, the second moment is not enough to construct this, this, this object. We really have to bound the piece moment for arbitrary p. So this is the hard work. Um, so I have a picture um, for, for, for the two moment calculation. Um, um, you see, I, 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 I think of psi z as a positive charge. You know, a psi uh, count complex a complex conjugate of psi as a negative charge. Then initially, you know, you have crossing term, and then you have like uh, square terms, the, the self loops. Now the renormalization is just you, you just cancel out the two red loops. So, um, if you want to study higher moments, um, this kind of picture really helps. So, um, so say if you want to study the sixth moment. Then basically you have six charges. Um, three of them uh, are positive. Three of them are negative. Then between each pair you have a you have a potential you have a, a kind of kernel. Uh, so we want to bound this kind of guy. So we really need to work hard to implement a multi-scale analysis. And in the end, basically, we can show this is um, this is essentially factorized. Um, but I'm going. Um, to, to check that, or is there, is there something non equilibrium about this? So these charges live in space and time. Oh, they do live in space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if if they live in the same space, only the two dimensional space, I think this guy has uh, some sort of a determinant uh, de determinantal representation. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, well, I, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but 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 they really live on space time. So um Okay. So this is just to check your C minus one hypothesis with probability high probability, right? Right. It's almost it's almost surely almost sure. um uh, above my surely C minus one. Uh, yeah. Under this condition. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you use it for five. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so the psi is not that singular, and therefore we can use the typical PD argument. OK, um, now back to this PD. So what happens if psi is more singular? Um, so as you see, if beta square is larger, then psi, the regularity of psi is below negative 1. So how, how to solve this equation? Essentially, the Young theorem plus Schauder estimate argument breaks down. Now the regular structure comes in. Um, basically, the, the difficulty here is we don't know how to take a product between psi and uh, this smooth guy. So there's a distribution, this is a function, but the sum of the two regularities um, is, below, is, is, is below zero. So we, there's no classical way to define this product. OK. Uh, but this phenomena is not new. Uh, this also happens in. Stochastic, stochastic ODE. 
So let's look at this, because, uh, this ODE driven by Brownian motion. Um, the solution to this ODE should have regularity, uh, um, should have regularity uh, below one half, below holder one half. And then DB has regularity below negative one half. So the sum of two regularities is below zero. And therefore, we don't have classical way to define this product. But uh, just forget about the Ito calculus or Stranovich calculus. Let's, re let's take another point of view for this. Um, we, so what we are going to do is, um, you know, of course, we have a priori, a priori knowledge that the solution has regularity below 1 half. But actually, we know a little bit more. We also know the solution locally looks like Brownian motion. So if you really do a numerical simulation or something, um, if you, then you, you zoom in to a very little part of the path, um, uh, you just don't, you just don't, don't know if, if this uh, lo local part of the path is really Brownian motion or the solution to, to, the, to the equation. Okay. Um, rigorously speaking, I mean, uh, more, more uh, precisely speaking, what I mean by locally looking like Brownian motion is the increment of the solution is basically the increment of Brownian motion. So up to some constant here, up to some smoother part here. Okay. Now, if x locally looks like Brownian motion, then since f is a smooth function, so f of x also uh, looks uh, locally looks like Brownian motion. Of course. Now, if you put this answers into the equation, then essentially you only have to define the product between Brownian motion and the dB. Because this smooth, you only miss a little bit of regularity here. Um, as long as this term is smoother than the Brownian motion, then this, this term can be, uh, can be multiplied with the dB in a classical way. So, so essentially, in the, in the beginning, it looks like we have to define generic element in holder one half space uh, uh, with a product with it, uh, product with, with the DB. Uh, we, have to, we have to take a, the product for a generic element by, by hand. Um, but actually, you only need to do one product uh, by hand. You only need to um, define what you mean by BDB, then everything is, is just defined. Um, of course, you, you, only, you also need to show, um, you know, um, if you, you, you still want to take, you still want to use the fixed point argument. So uh, you need to show that um, uh, after you, you take this product, then you uh, take a time integral, then this guy is still living in such a space. Okay. This is another, another crucial step. So for this example, this is, yeah, this is a, uh, called the uh, controlled rough pass. Uh, controlled rough pass theory, or, or rough pass theory, by Terry Lyons and Gubinelli. Oh, it's Gubinelli? Uh, Gubinelli and Terry Lyons and so on. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they consider SOD in this point of view. And uh, actually, they can consider more singular paths a driven path, let's say a fractional Brownian motion is lower regularity. Then they have to define more product like BDB or BDBDB like that. Or the iterate, they have to make sense of like two products or three products as B becomes more and more singular. Yes, there are cases where you don't put, you don't even have unique, it's like, you know, uh, passive scalar, uh, gas to passive scalar. Uh, Yeah. 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 Anyway, I mean, the point is we can make an analogy. So um, this is SOD, and this is the equation of our interest. Um, now, psi is very singular, too singular that we can not define product classically. Here, the dB is too singular. Um, we have the same problem. 
And uh, you know, for ODE, uh, we make the knowledge, make use of knowledge that at small scale, the solution looks like B, the Brownian motion. In other words, it looks like the time integral of the noise. So the analogy on the right hand side is the solution V should locally lo look like heat kernel convolved the noise per se. Uh, here is like the heavy side function convolved the noise. Here is the heat kernel convolved the noise. So this should be the local behavior of the solution V. Okay. So since on, on the left hand side, in the end, you only have to define one product B and the DB. And uh, here, we only have to consider product of k per psi with per psi. So you only have to define one product. Okay. Of course, there is a whole theory of regular structures by Martin Heyer, which uh, really uh, make this analogy work. Um, so it only remains to define uh, this product. Right? So remember, per psi is a limit of the renormalized e to the i beta phi. Right? And uh, we already know, so, so this, this is the, the, the explicit form of that guy, so per psi times heat kernel convolve per psi bar, the con conjugate. Um, so let's just take a first moment. In the end, we have to bound the arbitrary moment, but let's take the first moment. Um, you know, I already showed you that the correlation of per psi and the per psi bar is equal to this function to the power um, negative beta square over 2 pi. I showed, in the, in, showed earlier this result. Um, now, you know, the heat kernel is also singular at origin. So this is actually a um, divergent uh, integral. So it's not integrable uh, at origin for, for larger. So W is, uh, is space and time. Yes. Yeah. All the variables are space and time. All variables. Yeah, so the, the uh, R2 plus 1. Hmm. Yeah, so if beta square is bigger than 4 pi, this becomes non integrable. Okay, so actually the renormalization, again, you have to renormalize this product, just like the way we define per psi itself. Um, now, this is the second renormalization constant coming in. Uh, we have to subtract. Uh, divergent constant and divergent constant is exactly defined as this divergent integral. Okay, um, so um, what does it mean on the level of equations? Again, you, so once you do a renormalization on on on, on, uh, on this kind of object, then we ask uh, how how does the renormalization uh, reflect it in the level of uh, of the equation? So, oh right, right. So this should be uh, this norm, this difference plus the epsilon. So, so I forgot to put. Yeah, of course, I mean, I, otherwise this is simply infinity. Yeah. Simply infinity. Yeah, yeah regularize regularize this guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so we want to define this product, and then we introduce a renormalization. Actually, if you make if if you think about the analogy again, um, this is like BDB, right. where B is Brownian motion. So, if you remember the Ito calculus, um, um, if you just regularize the Brownian motion, and then take the limit, it's not the really the Ito product. You have to subtract a like um, one half times the you know that's the Ito Ito Stranovich correction term. So this C is essentially also a Ito Stranovich kind of uh, correction term, except that this is going to infinity. Just divergent. Um, so it's not surprising that um, at the the the, the at the level of the equation, uh, this renormalization amounts to Subtracting a kind of Ito Stranovich correction term. So, if you think about this as a dB, so this is really the form of uh, Ito Stranovich correction term. 
And uh, remember, we have two terms in the equation. There, there's another product. Then we also subtract the etox to a knowledge correction term. And it turns out that two renormalization terms cancel out. So this renormalization, this second renormalization constant, actually turns out it does not appear in the equation level. So, so the equation is the same? The same. De derivative, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this does not solve uh, the equation for arbitrary beta. Actually, this only solves the equation for beta squared slightly larger than four pi. This is because uh, you remember, starting from four pi. Psi has uh, starts to have regularity below negative one, so we need to define product between psi and the k psi. Right? But then, if beta gets larger, if beta square is sixteen pi over three, then psi is actually more singular. So it, the singularity is negative four over three. So even if you have already defined this product. Then, by another uh, by another Picard iteration, so you, you, so you, when you do the fixed point argument, essentially it's a Picard iteration. So you are going to get uh, another heat kernel convolve this product, and then you have to multiply this guy by psi. So you you need to define this new product by hand again. So as beta gets larger and larger, you have a infinite sequence of thresholds that. Beyond each beyond each uh, critical uh, each value, you have to define one more product. Essentially. So this this is why we stop at, uh, at our first paper stop at this value. Okay. So between zero and four pi, the the product of Bush method just works. Then between four pi and sixteen pi over three, we use regular structure. So we are also working to show uh, we want to have a systematic way to bound all these products and. Uh, and solve the equation up to 8 pi. And it turns out that um, um, on the quantum field theory side, uh, they observe the same value, 8 pi. Uh, this is so-called costly Tauli's phase transition. Um, uh, of course, first uh, ob observed by physicists and uh, rigorous proved by Froelich and Spencer. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, so from the PDE point of view, we, we discovered the same uh, critical value. So beyond 8 pi, we simply don't expect any, we any solution. We work above 8 pi, right? Uh, we work, so we work, you work below 8 pi, which is less understood in some way. You work above 8 pi. Yeah. Uh, um, where we get a free field, basically. So yes, yes. Below 8 pi, you, you're going to get, well, you'll get you can construct the measure. Okay. Uh, below 8 pi, you'll have a massive theory. Uh, above 8 pi, there'll be a uh, Gaussian free field. Uh, uh, but below 8 pi, uh, it, you know, very ma many open questions. Uh, still, as far as I know, we don't want uh, people to work on uh, But uh, yeah. Even, the, even for beta, even, even in the 4 pi region, the things we, I don't think, the things we know, but I don't think we know. Let's say, you know, uh, generation yeah. mass. But then to that, you have to go to the infinite volume. You have to, yeah. you have to go to large volumes to see that. Uh -huh. um, I don't know whether your techniques will help in that, but that's the yeah. pretty, pretty So good. a lot of people, a lot of problems uh, of excitumity are, are trying to understand this, this regime. Yeah. yeah, so I would say we're still in the ultraviolet regime. So we, we yeah. understand the local, uh, yeah. local fluctuation, local behavior. Um, so below eight pi, um, of course, it's very hard to understand the, the massive behavior in the large scale. Uh, uh, but uh, I think the small scale problem and ultraviolet problem is is all some sort of uh, results there. Um, well, there are lots of you know Ben Plato, Galavanti, yeah. all those yeah. guys have worked very hard. I don't know how far they got up. I don't think uh -huh. they got. Uh -huh. Just to define yeah. the field theory. 
Yeah, th they work on continuum limit. All the continuum limit, no, no, uh, no mass, no, no uh, yeah. macroscopic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We are also in that kind of region. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit how the same idea works for 5.4. Um, so in two dimension, the, the part of the Bush method, again, works for, for 5.4 uh, equation. So the idea is the same. You write the solution to the linear equation, which is called a phi naught, and then write down the equation for the remainder v. Same as sine and golden. Now, just like sine and golden, now I want to define these coefficients. So these coefficients are the new random inputs. So the idea is, again, by renormalization, you should replace these powers by weak powers. And we can show the, let me, after renormalization, the limit exists and the limit uh, have regularity below 0. Uh, in two dimension. Um, so when construct these powers, it's much simpler than sine golden because there's something called equivalence moment or, or so-called hy uh, hypercontractivity, which says essentially you only have to bound the second moment. Higher moment auto automatically bound it. So phi this is why phi four is simpler than sine golden. Okay. Um, and also you can use the product Bush method to to solve the remainder using the fixed point argument in the space, say, C1. Okay. Um, so this, the product of Bush method breaks down in three dimension because in three dimension, this power simply becomes more singular. So the regularity is now below negative one uh, instead of zero. So in three dimension, it's more singular. And therefore, if you just take your v from c1, then this product cannot be classical defined. Yeah, it's the same problem as, as um, sine golden for beta square larger than 4 pi. And these parallel product stuff, is that, is that good there? Parallel product works. It does work. Uh, yeah, it works for 5, 4, 3. But it does work for 5, 4, 3. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, OK. so. In three dimension, uh, we have to apply regular structure. So uh, just uh, to recapitulate the regular structure, uh, this theory, in this theory, we formulate fixed point argument in space of functions or distrib distributions with not only priori knowledge about the regularity, but also some delicate description of local behavior. For example, you say your solution should locally behave like Browning pass or some heat kernel convolve the noise, et cetera. Um, and then you show um, the fixed point map brings this generic element, which has this behavior, back to a, another element, which also has this behavior. Um, another point is um, that this is special choice of uh, Function or distribution space. Another increment in, in this th new theory is we also need to define a few, pr a few products or objects by renormalization procedure, okay. uh, like the BDB. Um, now, in three dimension, actually, we also write a, like a perturbation, then plus a remainder. Then um, so, so this, this lambda is a formal parameter in front of nonlinearity. So this, this way of writing, writing down the linear solution is just like a zero order perturbation theory. But in general, you can you assume your solution to be a power series in lambda. And then uh, uh, phi zero, phi naught is still the Gaussian part, the linear part. Then phi one is the next order. Okay. So you can, you can also write down the equation for phi one. You can stop here. and. Uh, then solve the remainder equation. Actually, uh, if you just assume your remainder is in some holder space or typical best of space, then you, you always have a prob problem to define um, a product between like 
actually it's phi zero squared times r. Okay. And then the, the ideal renormalization is we make on us that uh, the ideal regular structure is we make on us that the r locally behaves like heat kernel convolve the square. Actually, this should be the renormalized square, the weak square of the Gaussian process. Okay. If you make this on us, then you can solve the remainder equation in the space of functions behave like this. Okay. Um, so if you know, so if you make this on us, then then you have to define one product between phi naught square and uh, k convolve phi naught square, and uh, the way to define this product is again by a renormalization procedure. This gives another renormalization constant, which is well known in, in quantum field theory, in constructive field theory. Uh, that's the uh, kind of sunset bubble uh, renormalization. Uh, so, so this this is the phi four in two space dimension, three space dimension. Um, I would like to make a few another, another some, some remarks. Um, so global solution is also constructed for phi four um, uh, in, in both two and three dimensions. Um, so the the second reference uses the Bragain argument. Uh, they show for almost sure initial data you can solve the equation globally um, for a long time. I mean, and they don't um, use the, the existence, the a priori existence of the invariant measure. They they use it. They so use yeah. It. So, so they, 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 they in other words, it can't be derived from start from the start. You have to know the existence of the invariant measure. You have to know the existence of the four measure to begin with. To begin with that, yeah, this is uh, what the second reference does. But then the first reference actually does every initial data. Yeah, but, um, uh, yeah, but, but <coughs> do they use the fact that you have, in other words, is this another way to prove the existence of a 5 4 theory? Or do they have, uh, to, do no. they have to use, this have a to measure. use the existence of a 5 4 theory, which is developed you know, by constructive field theory? Right. Then, then they can prove. This approaches that globally in time. Uh, we, so there's no result about approaching to, okay, to the universe. Let's say, uh, maybe I'll ask you later. Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah, I mean, yeah, there is also something called uh, another direction called uh, uh, universality problems, basically. Uh, uh, I mean, there's another equation called KBZ, but then uh, also phi four. They, they they put uh, high order powers into the equation, and then they do some sort of so-called weak asymmetry scaling, and show the higher powers are all vanish. Um, um, uh, but but I mean they they do not simply vanish. They have some contribution to the limit, and the limit is still KBZ or uh, phi four equation. Okay. And uh, we can also show. Uh, 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 we can also uh, prove prove the we can also construct a solution to equation driven by non Gaussian field. Uh, this means if you take a um, um, non Gaussian smooth field, then rescale it according to the Y noise scaling. Then by standard central limit theorem, of course, this noise goes to space time Gaussian Y noise. Um, but then it turns out that we have to renormalize the equation, and uh, we have to do extra renormalization of the equation. And extra renormalization depends on higher cumulants of the non-Gaussian field. Um, yeah, basically, I, I've been spinning. Still, actually, in the, like you, how we set it up, so you still get a continuum by a fourth theory, right? Yes. Or, or, or you know, still get or a sine Gordon field theory as a limit. As a limit. Yeah. You, you would get that. Yeah. Driven by Gaussian Y noise. Well, you would have non. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Start from Ga uh, start, start from non Gaussian. Start with other noises and, and still and still get the and still get the what you would get from Gaussian noise. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But the renormalization will be different. It will depend on higher cumulants. Yeah. Not because it's not like because the non Gaussian field goes to the no, Gaussian no. noise. No, to Therefore, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <coughs> and. Uh, yeah, there are also some results about, you, you know, you start from particle system, say global dynamics of Ising model with cuts potential, with long range potential. Uh, 
So these people can show uh, if they have, uh, they, uh, they can converge to the, the 5 4 equation. Okay. Mm. So the last, maybe I spent three minutes uh, so to briefly study, uh, briefly talk about another equation I'm recently looking at. Um, so this is the equation from gauge theory. So, you know, for the other examples like uh, five four or sine golden, essentially they are just uh, heat equation plus something else. Um, they are just uh, parabolic. So equations coming from stochastic quantization of gauge theory, um, apparently they are not parabolic. So here I consider two space dimension and I consider uh, the Maxwell e equation. So A is a vector field and then this is a curvature. So A is, is, is also one form if you want. And then the quantum field theory measure looks like this. So it's, uh, it's still a uh, Gaussian-like, it's quadratic. Um, the corresponding PSPD is um, something like this. So uh, apparently uh, this is not a complete Laplacian. So the problem is it's not parabolic. And all the Schroeder estimate, all the parabolic theory does not simply apply. Um, well, we can make use of so-called gauge symmetry. Let me I can skip this. Um, uh, we, can, we can make use of the um, gauge symmetry and play a so-called the Turk trick. So we just look at a parabolic equation. So let B solve this parabolic version of the equation. Then, of course, B I mean, you, you can just show this well post. It's linear. And then based on the solution B, we define A to be B minus a time integral of this. This is like a, a exact one form, which depends on B. So if you define A like this, then um, you just uh, write down the time evolution of A. So you can check. Um, so, so you just plug in this into the equation, then you, you see um, here you get a, um, you get a Laplacian B, then you get a uh, derivative divergent, and then for, for the other equation, for the second equation, you also have uh, Laplacian, and then it turns out this cancel out. And in the end, you have, you have you can show that A satisfied the original equation. Okay. Here, you have to make use of the fact that um, if you define A out from B in this particular way, then F of A is simply equal to F of B. So two curvatures are the same. Okay. So um, this is called the Turk trick. We can turn the problem into a parabolic problem. Um, and uh, this is considered as the uh, time-dependent family of gauge transformations. So I'm recently working on the, um, the case that you have uh, this U1 gauge theory coupled with the complex valued field. Then the coupling is in, um, the coupling occurs in the, in the gauge covariant derivative. So you have uh, A times the phi here. So, so here you have nonlinearities. Um, so yeah, so essentially we want to solve a parabolic version of this equation, which is called the equation for B and the Psi. Now I have a uh, family, uh, I mean time-dependent family of gauge transformations, but this transformation also acts on the noise now, right? because maybe for pulse problem, you don't have the noise, um, you don't have this extra problem. But now I really want to argue that this gauge transformation is regular enough so I can I can take this gauge transformation acting on the noise. I'm working on this. So I think I can just stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>